Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. In the American mind, Russia is associated with the Soviet Union. The Reds, the Commies, the Ruskies, a general menace going back to the Russophobia of the 19th century and continuing until the fear of Putin today. But what really remains of the Russian left? How does American interference undermine it? What should we make of the recent elections? And what's the state of Russian politics as it relates to its population and the world today? There's no better expert to discuss these issues than Russian leftist and activist Alexei Saknin. Alexei, welcome. And I'll also add that you are also a journalist, left front activist, and a former political refugee, which is something I, I want to ask you about. But before we get into all that, um, I guess the question we should start with, since it's in the news, is, you know, Russia just had elections. And so were they significant? And what happened and why? They were significant as the most boring and shameful elections <laughs> in all boring and uh, shameful history of Russian elections. Of wow. Russian, uh, modern democracy. <laughs> uh, and I'm quite serious, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, history of democracy in Russia have finished almost before it started. It have started mm. uh, 1996. There were significant election which were hypothetically and almost for sure were falsificated. With um, and that falsification was uh, accepted by all Western leaders: Bill Clinton, uh, Kohl in Germany. Um, John Major in Britain and so on and so on. And after that, and they were they were uh, falsificated in the name of democracy. People who who falsificated elections in 1996 and three years before 1993 make a military coup and shut the parliament building. They called themselves Democrats and they were fighting against communists. So after they build democracy on that um, fantastic fu fundament, every new elections became more and more boring, more and more shameful, more and more falsificated, more and more open falsificated. And uh, the results of elections were uh, well known like long before they had happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, two days ago, there were three days ago, there were elections uh, in the eighth uh, assembly of uh, Russian parliament, eighth uh, period of Russian parliament. So it was first between all eight <laughs> in the level of boreness and uh, shame. <laughs> wow. It looked like that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 14 parties who run, but uh, nine of them are nobody from nowhere. Nobody knew those names, even political experts like me. <laughs> and nobody should uh, never uh, remember those names. So there are five more or less serious groups who run. And uh, let's say all of them are made in Kremlin. Less than oh. other is Communist Party. Mm -hmm. Communist Party is the only one political structure which is, which is not really independent, but let's say of, of, autonomous. Of, autonomous. Okay. Sorry for my English, but I hope you... No, 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 I understand me. what you mean. Autonomous, yeah? Autonomous from uh, the ruling oligarchy and the uh, president's administration. Mm -hmm. And uh, that... This time, uh, Communist Party looked as a natural uh, choice for all protest voters, mm -hmm. for all who are not satisfied uh, with uh, Russian uh, leadership, with Vladimir Putin, current political and social situation, um, problems with democracy and freedom of speech. And doesn't matter if you are liberal, economical liberal, or left-wing person, or just crazy guy um, with mixed ideas. So you have to, almost you have to vote 
for Communist Party or stay home. And okay. that is probably real choice. According mm. official data, just 50% of Russian citizens voted on, on uh, these elections. But there are a line of regions. Russia is quite a big country. There are 85 regions and let's say 20 of them. We call them electoral sultanates. Ele- electoral su- sultanates. Mm-hmm. They used to vote with 99% of voters and 95 of them vote for a governmental party. <laughs> so if we would exclude them from count, and it's like Chechnya, you know, probably you have heard about Chechnya and its uh, special um, political and social system. So they are not really Russia. And then on these elections, also big open uh, falsifications return to Russia after 10 years. And we can count them all almost. If we would uh, paint the graphic, paint the picture of all electoral points, then you will see that like 80% of um, electoral places would get 30, 35 percent to to governmental party, and then there is there are twenty percent of vote uh, voting places, which give them ninety nine percent. So there was um, places even in Moscow, even everywhere, in especially in uh, countryside where elections was let's say totally falsified. Wow. In Moscow, they were totally they were falsificated with uh, on high tech level, let's say. <laughs> uh, after a few years of experiments, now in Moscow and six uh, other regions, people had the opportunity to vote through internet, electronic democracy, let's say, mm-hmm. open and um, straight, direct democracy. <laughs> But uh, in many governmental enterprises like Moscow Subway or com- com- communal uh, enterprises, uh, wow, wow. Uh, bosses press to all uh, personnel to vote on working places mm-hmm. and. Sh- like to come to the administrative room and vote there. Of mm-hmm. course, ninety-nine percent of them knew whom they have to choose. Yeah. So, in Moscow, there are seven and a half million of registered voters. Half of them officially voted, have voted, and half of them, so half of all who voted, voted through internet. And if you compare them who voted on, on in schools in like usual places their um, governmental party took just second place after communist party wow. and nine districts um, we have uh, uh, combined electoral system half of parliament voted with parties and half with um, with candidates um, like in Britain or you know, major, major, majoritarian system. Yeah. Uh, so, so in Moscow, in the party part, Communist Party won mm-hmm. over uh, governmental party first time, probably for twenty wow. years. And uh, in nine districts from fifteen, also won oppositional candidates. Seven of them from Communist Party and two from other groups. But then. You, sh- you have to add all that uh, electronic high-tech uh, voting, which is yeah. totally, totally not transparent, which <laughs> were, results were published one day after voting without mm-hmm. any explanation. And their situation is totally different. <laughs> so if you count them together, then governmental party won, in all districts, in party run as well, and everything is okay. Official official result is uh, 49.50 or 0.80, uh, 
and uh, they won 199 from uh, 225 majoritarian districts. So they have constitutional majority again. I see. And those real rating and real level of support is not more than one third part. You asked about public discussion. Yeah. Uh, usually, uh, liberal mainstream, both in West and Russian oppositional media, describe Russia as a, let's say, prison where public discussion is impossible. I would say, in many ways, Russian public discussion is more broad, more uh, broad, diverse, diverse. bigger than, than, than uh, in the West. Much more questions and much more possible uh, discourses, much more possible answers. So polls of Russian politics are much uh, long away from the center than in the West. So, and even Russian authorities, even Putin and his um, his uh, um, uh, near circles, mm -hmm. they spend a lot of time and a lot of forces to speak with, not just with elite, with ruling class, but also through media, media level, but also with uh, usual people. In some ways, they use populist rhetorics. Putin uh, used to say, oh, you know, I'm from the working class family. It's his um, usual rhetoric. Um, it's his usual rhetoric, but in when it came to practice, it's very elitaristic system. So all social mobility is stopped. In the last 10 years, it was just blocked totally. Uh, so in some way, if you, let's say, in, in big TV, it's very authoritarian picture. So, but big TV is still exists just for people in countryside who are 10 or 15 percent of population. So in big cities, if everybody have access to uh, fast internet and in internet, you can find, let's say, two big camps. Kremlin one, which is boring and uh, uh, impossible one. <laughs> And then big and quite professional media main, uh, liberal mainstream with quite big TV channel, Dost, and quite big radio station. The biggest one radio station, Echo Moscow, with uh, filials all over the country, quite big newspapers and uh, internet uh, editions. Last year, they are really under some pressure. This year, they are under hard pressure. We have to recognize it. It's true. For example, most part of them this year were officially recognized as a, as a, a foreign agents, which made those life much harder. So this, this year... Was, this was, this was the, the foreign agents label was a response to the U.S. labeling. Yes, yeah, as, labeling. As, Right. As our uh, foreign minister and his um, assistants uh, explain, yes, it's a, a, a copy of the U.S. Uh, law. You're welcome. <laughs> we, are in, we, we are living in the West. Russia is not yeah. this far from the West. Yeah. Every terrible shit you will find in Russia have the same analog in uh, in the western world probably sometimes in some other forms you have populist politicians right mm -hmm. and left we as well yeah you have authoritarian uh, tendencies and uh, authorities are accused sometimes in the um, uh, falsification of elections and we have the same <laughs> you have uh, problems with freedom of speech we have probably more a yeah. bit more let's yeah. say um, we have repressions, political repressions, but take France, street yeah. repressions against uh, uh, Yellow West, 
looking U.S. conservative activists. I don't like them, but they're under oppressions. Yeah. Let me let me let me ask you something because you you kind of were were going into this a bit, but your obviously your answer was nuanced and complex. That said, whether elections are fair or not. Putin does seem to have some popularity. So my question for you is, among the people who do like him, why is he popular? Putin, st Putin still have a kind of support. Governmental party have double less support. Mm -hmm. They they used to look in, in people's eyes as a corrupt bureaucrats. And they are. Um, so, yes, Putin have support and um, hypothetically today in a transparent presidential election, he have many chances to win, but probably not in the first, uh, in the first uh, tour. So I'm not sure if he still uh, able to take 50% of votes in the honest election. But... Mm -hmm. 30 or 40, I'm sure he still can. So to understand and to, uh, to understand his popularity and nature of his popularity, first you, you can get this uh, type of uh, metaphor. You know, Russia is a very big country and the main traditional transport is the railroad. They are not this popular in um, Lebanon, as I heard. <laughs> we don't have railroads, but yeah. <laughs> but Russia is a very railroad country, as old America, you know, in 19th century or beginning of 20th century. So railroad, and um, there are thousands um, slow trains going a few days probably from Moscow to Far East, to Vladivostok, to Siberia, and in every one, in every uh, wagon, uh, you know, I live in Sweden. Sometimes Swedish words come. Uh, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so, so in every train, in every part of the train, they are sitting five people and discussing politics. It's very traditional picture. Mm -hmm. Every Russian will recognize it. They are sitting and discussing history and politics, and between five persons. There would be two communists, probably very strange communists, not in, in Western sense, but let's say conservative communists. There would be probably two kind of patriots or nationalists and one liberal. All five would be quite critical, more or less critical against government. Three of them hard critical, two of them moderate critical to government. There would not be anyone who would defend Putin. Mm. That creates an um, atmosphere that there is no anyone who support Putin. But you have to remember that all other 50 persons in um, uh, that part of the train who are sleeping, they are probably, or majority of them, or half of them, are Putin supporters. They vote for Putin. Yeah. So Putin's support is very special one. It's very passive one. Putin and Putin regime as a system never tried to, to mobilize people, to organize them as like communist regime did all 70 years of Soviet history. As many as, as Venezuela regime still doing. So mm -hmm. Russian regime demobilize even so even its own supporters it's very passive support and it's support let, let's say paternalistic support it's mostly people who are working in budget or, or governmental enterprises often in uh, far deep depressive provinces who depends from those bosses and governors. Sometimes it's like budget workers, teachers or small bureaucrats or even workers in the governmental, big governmental enterprises. So that, that is type of support. Then why they support, those reasons to support. 
Of course, part of the support is a result of pressure. The director of big enterprise can call all workers and said, if our plant with hundred thousands of workers, uh, last be uh, uh, cargo cars uh, plant in Kazan, eighty nine thousand workers. So if we will not give ninety five percent of votes for re- governmental party, we will not get the governmental. Um, uh order like for, yeah. for production mm-hmm. so we will not get uh, uh money and uh, and like we will not produce ten thousand cars for army or something like this so it's mixed of rational and uh, not rational uh, mobilization i see but then there is also let's say rational reasons to be own as supporters of putin mm-hmm. because the hugest psychological and social trauma of the russian people of all ethnic groups all peoples of russia is 90s 90s mm-hmm. when the soviet socialistic social system which was not ter- terrible which was not uh, like every days in everyday level was not dictatorship with uh, the risk to be shot at and uh, to, to travel to Gulag somewhere in East Siberia. No, it was quite humanistic one. It meant that education from first degree to the endless, <laughs> as many high education as you want, as Bernie Sanders want, you can get for free. And it was quite cool, you know. And then you can make a quite cool career, not in politics. Probably in politics, you can do it as well if you will join Communist Party. Yeah. But in uh, science, you are very welcome. You can born in uh, the poor village somewhere in Tajikistan and the Afghan border and came during 20 years of your life from the almost stone age to 20th century, you know, of big city with all uh, cultural destinations, with East European level of life, as in Poland, less than in US probably and Western Europe, but not tragical one. And it get better and better every year. Then it was a, one of the best medical system in the, the world. It was like Cuba, but much richer with yeah. all medicines. Yeah. It was, uh, there was no even war, word uh, homeless. No one. It was crime wow. to be homeless. Uh, not all flats were comfortable. Most part of them were in gray, you know, um, uh, stereotype houses and so on. But everybody had a flat and uh, tack- uh, roof uh, yeah. under their head. Then uh, everybody got a quite well medical service with the hugest number of medical personnel per um, per 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 thousand uh, or ten thousand of population, you know, in the world. Mm-hmm. It was a society with the highest l- level of scientists per um, population, with uh, fantastic uh, social mobility. And then all that system with extreme stability, even quite boring stability. You never have risk to to lose job. Yeah. No unemployment. <laughs> and then not not uh, uh, this much to do at work. So during working day you have a lot of time to <laughs> went to shop, and then stay in line and wait for when you can buy some products. But so yeah. it was interesting system, and then during weeks, it was totally destroyed. I remember I was ten years old, January nineteen ninety two, mm-hmm. when uh, Igor Gaidar uh, government <clears throat> make free prices, and directly during two or three days, all empty shops became full of production, very cheap production. Very bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, bush chicken, you know. <laughs> uh, 
but but salary of my parents who were children doctors oh in okay. us they would be quite rich people but mm-hmm. during one week those salary became from eastern european scale in 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 the first january there were eastern european scale 31st january you can buy one chevin gum for those wow. salary so we jumped in east africa poverty yeah during one month and everything was collapsed the values uh view on world um interpretation of life everything so it, it was real catastrophe let's say roman empire collapsed during one week jesus yeah and um millions of people millions of people russian economy became half of um during four years it it became less than half it's unprecedented economical catastrophe in modern history i, I guess yeah it's it was more than uh, germany after defeat in 1945 you know it was more than uh, soviet uh, union during the war when the most populated areas were occupied and destroyed by Germans. Half of working class people lose those jobs. Mm-hmm. The level of criminality from one of the lowest level between all uh, developed countries became the highest. The highest. The um, continuation of life, especially between men, became less on 15 years during yeah i don't know four or five years wow wow from yeah, like uh, 73 to 57 so it was very fast jump from 20th century end of the 20th century to kind of 17th century yeah russia which we lost 100 years ago we find again that that was catastrophe and millions of people and that catastrophe was introduced was realized under slogans of democracy and open market liberal economy mm. so both of that words both of that names both of that labels mean something terrible in people yeah, yeah. so in russian democracy one can make reef with shit <laughs> democrats shit Shitocratia. Yeah. So, and and the same time, all that Democrats, shitcrats, they made a real democracy, a real dictatorship. They shut parliament. Yeah. They falsified. With the backing, the- this is all. I just want to remind people: this is everything you're talking about was done with the advice and the support of the United States of, of the United States of America. With a, with a total open yeah. support with bill clinton's political um technologist or political cons- consultants consultants yes. on presidential elections mm-hmm. you know so and, and legitimization of all that terrible crimes mm-hmm. was russia is coming back to the uh, let's say magistral way of european civilization to the west uh, uh, capitalism to the um, uh, capitalist market <laughs> it was terrible it yeah. feels terrible. So inequality from the lowest level in world in socialist society, it became the highest between all big and uh, developed, more or less developed countries. Uh, then came Putin, and yes. Putin didn't change the the fundament of that system, but he made a rhetoric and symbolic compromise in the first days of his. Uh, president uh, condens president ter- term first ter- president term he returned the red flag as official symbol and those flag where millions of people died each family have grandfather or grand grandfather now 25 years grandfather probably who fight during the great patriotic war yes. so it was a very important symbol after 10 years of liberalism 
There was a huge nostalgia about all the symbols. He returned the gim, music of Soviet gim. He rehabilitated Russian patriotism. You know, it's normal to be proud of your history and right. not to be shame that you your native language is Russian. Mm-hmm. And Russian literature is quite cool one. It was wow, really. <laughs> It's not trying to be Russian. Um, he restored uh, army as a respectable institute in society, mm-hmm. and then even and it's important. Putin get luck on his term of uh, power. On his all twenty, almost all twenty years of his power, came the level uh, came the. Very cool all prices conjuncture, especially mm-hmm. first eight years, and then six years more. All prices escalated as shit. I don't know the uh, to to compare with what. Okay, <laughs> like grew as mushrooms. We, we used to say in Russian, <laughs> they grew as mushrooms. So government good and Russia is. Uh, uh one of two biggest exporter of oil and right. biggest uh, exporter of uh, gas and it's also means there uh, good prices for other types of russian export metal and wood and all other natural resources yeah so government got a lot of money during 80s and 90s all oil cost seven dollars per um barrel mm-hmm and uh, now it cost 82 something like this and yeah. it was the top was 120 so they got an, a lot of money they didn't knew how to spend money and the best uh, minister of fi- financial minister in the world alexei kudrin the leader of system liberals the liberal fraction in russian establishment putin's personal friend Mm-hmm. 12 years Putin's minister of um, financial minister, he put all that, almost all that dollars in US banks or Wall Street banks and forbid to spend them on Russian to, to develop Russian economy, to pay for Russian pensioners, to Russian budget workers. So it was typical new liberal politics with, you know, um, hard economy. So, so you're saying... Putin's popularity, at least when he came in, wasn't from it changing was the system. Social, social compromise. It yeah, was kind okay. of social compromise. He said, okay, the, the deal was like this. You people don't touch politics. It's not your business anymore. <laughs> okay. Once in four years, you came and show your loyalty. Your patriotic choice. Mm-hmm. And we will Take in account your interest in a form that all pensioners will get pension in time. In 90s, uh, working workers in industry and pensioners sometimes wait for to just to get those very small pension or, or salary for years, 18 wow. months, 15 months. And now just every every month. Is it nice? Nice. So get- people are like willing to settle. They're willing to settle for that. After and what then happened the in the 90s. Got, got became more during yeah. those eight years. Level of life grew up, but not equal. And then you, if you will see on Russian society, then you will find that twenty percent of Russian society now living better than they lived in Soviet Union. In Soviet Union, they everybody lived more or less the same level. Yeah. Uh, now twenty percent one. 20 or 15 or 20 percent have comparable level of life with mm-hmm. 20 years back or 30 years back and then 60 or 65 percent are still living um, worst same uh, bad than the soviet union worse. not not this well as they did in soviet time but yeah. still much better than in 90s so 90s is a night is a um 
when when you're sleeping and uh, see some terrible things. What do you call it? It's a nightmare. 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 A 90s was nightmare. a nightmare. Yeah. It's a yeah. nightmare. And that can put it always remind. You remember what was under the liberal ruling? And I the see. most most frontmen of the opposition are liberals. Well, and that's what I want to I actually want to ask you about this since you mentioned opposition is I, I want to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the other Alexei. Um, and that Sorry? is, of course, Alexei. I want to talk about the other Alexei, uh, Alexei Navalny, yeah. yes. um, who the West, you know, and I'm, I know that you know this, the Western media has made him into this popular freedom fighter. But you've known him for a long time. You are skeptical of him. So can you tell our listeners and viewers who is Alexei Navalny and what does he actually stand for? Uh, in January, I published an uh, article about him on uh, Jacobin. Yes. And got a lot of shit. Ah, really? <laughs> type of critics. <laughs> but still, first of all, Personally, I respect him. He's a very brilliant and talented politician and even in some way honest person who really believes both in um, his ideology and in his own personal um, uh, uh, star, you know, his personal <laughs> mission. Uh, he played a big ambitious game he voluntarily returned to Russia and he knew that it would lead him to prison. So my personal respect is point one. Mm -hmm. But point second, as a politician, as a represent, representant of ideology and strategy and some social interest, he is dangerous for Russia. He began as an activist of uh, liberal party Yablaka, where he was excluded in the middle of 2000s for nationalism. And uh, he really flirted, uh, played with Russian hardcore nationalism. Because in 2000s, nationalism looked the only one ideology with mobilization potential to mobilize anti-Putin um, support in uh, mass between in, in masses. So Alexei Navalny dis, um, <clears throat> decided that it's okay, acceptable thing, to be one of organizers of Russian marches, which was campaigned with very brown uh, atmosphere. You know, it's not Donald Trump. It's much harder. It's much harder than alternative for Germany. And he played with it. Um, the same time, he did a lot of anti-corruption investigations and published them in very popular form. And most part of that investigation was very interesting and showed the 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 level of corruption of russian nomenclature so as you see every in every thing you will find contradictions he was brilliant anti-corruption investigator but at the same time he played very uh, in my eyes shameful and dangerous game with hardcore nationalism mm. in 2012 there was one of the biggest political crises in during Putin's uh, period. And uh, we were together in kind of spontaneous coalition with Alexei Navalny. That coalition include all forces, left, liberals and nationalists. And we sat, sit in the same rooms in the same coalition. And uh, when authorities answered on that democratical movement with hard repressions, Alexei Navalny made a step back and let authorities destroy the left side, left wing of opposition in order to become a monopolist in that oppositional uh, room. And he became almost a monopolist 
in, let's say, radical opposition, in not parliamentary opposition, in opposition of street mobilizations. Uh, and he continued with the political and anti-corruption you know, campaigns during 10 years. He became from, he transformed from the top blogger and uh, uh, media star to serious politician. Now he is a leader of the radical street protest opposition. In all the country, his uh, rating, it's difficult to, to <clears throat> be sure because now he's sitting in prison. So he is not the uh, real candidate in some election and will not be in nearest future. But we can say that his support is something in between 15 and 20 percent. It's quite high support. And it's more than other, all other liberal politicians would, uh, can even dream about. So in some way, Alexei Navalny is a miracle of Vladimir Putin. <laughs> He's kind of populist who mixed discourses, mixed values. Last three years, he played a lot with a not uh, nationalistic, but left-wing populism. He had mm. applied to the you know, inequality, social inequality, to the poverty, to the almost not socialistic, but social demands of majority. And he got a lot of poems. He got a lot of popularity from that type of rhetoric. If you will look on his last films, anti-corruption uh, investigations against Putin, for example, which were extremely popular and almost all nation looked on them. So he compare, compare the level of luxury of uh, top elite with poverty of uh, working majority. Who he, he is in, this, in that film, he looked like a very socialist, as a Bernie Sanders. Uh, five years ago, he compared himself with Donald Trump. Who was quite popular in Russia. Last two or three years, he com he preferred compared himself with Bernie Sanders <laughs> because because that left turn turned to the social demands to more equality is a uh, universal in all the world. It's not only in U.S. Right. and France. It's the same in Russia. So, as Putin, Navalny is very. He smells where wind is coming yeah. and he oriented for that wind and do it with a brilliant talent. As a Vladimir Putin, he is very authoritarian and let's say charismatical chief of his movement. He is totally <laughs> not uh, able to make coalitions and alliances. So in his alliance, you have to come and say, yes, Führer. Yeah, Führer. Only one person exists in that type of organization, campaign, coalition. So even many liberals hate him because they they, they are not recognize themselves in that construction. Mm. I remember, I think in the article you wrote about him, you actually, you mentioned how he's very astute at, at really like playing to the sort of popularity that people are feeling. Like you say, in just a couple of years, he went from praising Donald Trump to praising Bernie Sanders. But as far as his actual economic ideology is concerned, you portrayed him as being even more to the Joseph right. Joseph Biden economical ideology. <laughs> <laughs> so very neoliberal, very pro-capitalist. Very neoliberal and very pro-capitalist. Sometimes okay. it was very funny. For example, he tried a few times to register parties. And uh, it was forbidden because of uh, governmental authoritarianism. Let's recognize it. It's true. So, but uh, when he ran the protest, he published a program. And one of the paragraphs in the program was to make higher uh, pension, um, the, the, the re retirement age, uh, age of patient. Do you understand me? Yeah, yeah. So from 55 years, make it 
65, let's mm. say. Mm -hmm. 2008, that's horrible. Yeah, that's horrible. It's terrible, it's terrible yeah. and extremely unpopular. But it's very popular in liberal subculture. Of in course. small liberal subculture, which can mobilize 5% of support, <laughs> it's a very popular idea. Best idea. <laughs> no one ruble to stupid poor idiots. <laughs> let them work for the die until mm -hmm. they die. And remember that um, uh, Russians are living just for 70 years now, especially men. They died very early. So 65 years of retirement is... Um, like almost till you die. Like years yeah. before this. Right. Nice. So, yeah. Yeah. Very <laughs> okay. economical. Yeah. Econom economy. Many economy. Mm -hmm. um, so 2018, exactly that reform was realized by Vladimir Putin directly after he got uh, his new presidential... When, when he won... Presidential elections in March 2018. Mm -hmm. And it was extremely unpopular. And Putin rating get down on 20%. Mm -hmm. And governmental party crack down on 25%. So that atmosphere which I described in the beginning was a result of 2018 in very many sense. In very I many... Sense. I see. Well, uh, Alexei Navalny started yeah. to organize demonstration against that reform. And mm -hmm. when journalists and people like me asked, wait, Alexei, just two years ago, you published a program <laughs> where you, you promised the same reform. So it's not a time to discuss now. Now we should fight. <laughs> and he organized demonstration in that way to split the um, protest with other organizer was a communist party and he organized separately. I see. So not to let be communist left, left is a independent force in streets mm -hmm. or to make them weaker. That type of politician is Alexei Navalny, but it, it's, not a, it's not a crime. He, mm -hmm. We should remember that he is sitting in prison because Russia now is authoritarian and repressive dictatorship. It's dialectic. Well, dialectic. I, I, but I do want to ask you, and I because I think this kind of fits in, is you know Americans have been fed these scary stories since 2016 of Russian interference in our elections and our politics, but. In fact, as you know, there is a longer history and a more serious history of American interference in Russian elections like we talked about in the 90s, but also with supporting opposition figures um, and movements in Russia. And so I'm curious if the U.S. support for like NGOs and civil society and people like Alexei Navalny, if that makes it more difficult to operate as legitimate opposition in Russia? Like, does that give the authorities an excuse to crack down? Does that make it harder to organize? Just in order to be a bit original between all speakers about Russia in the West, let I see the thesis. The main whom West support is Vladimir Putin. <laughs> that rhetoric war between Russia is not just a game, but in many ways, it's still a game. Mm -hmm. Russia is included in the global economy as a source of cheap natural resources. And it's a terrible for development um, developed country to be just a source of natural resources. That means that Education doesn't matter. That there is uh, no um, development in high technologies and science. That country transforms to the tube with gas and oil. And Putin, as a guarant of that terrible status of Russia, is very acceptable. And all Western sanctions 
they do not even touch that uh, fundamental things and structures which include Russia as a periphery of the global capitalism. Mm. Uh, the best, I guess, in my opinion, the best thing for US and uh, let's say Western imperialism is Putin, but weak Putin. Weak Putin. Of mm. course, uh, conflict with Crimea was very painful for the American world, for Washington consensus, for the political system which Washington built for many years. It means that some other subject can change principal things, borders and territories. And that is a message for all dictators in all the world that uh, White House in Washington is not the necessary instance to decide questions. So after Crimea, crisis became very serious. And that Cold War in media and uh, strange war in Ukraine and in some in Syria became real problems which affected millions of people, which may make life of people in Syria or Ukraine terrible, which affected people in Russia as well. But it does not affect the fundament of the Putin regime. Because that fundament is uh, very acceptable and very necessary to keep the new liberal capitalistic system in its, in its economical, social and geopolitical level. Then uh, what did uh, uh, State Department all last 20 years? They supported politicians and that part of civil society which have no any democratical perspectives. So liberals, they have huge support in the ruling elite. Ruling elite is mostly liberal, very liberal, include Putin. Mm. But uh, it have some support in the upper middle class, which is 10% population in Russia. But it have no any support in between working majority. So Americans, or let's say the structures affiliated with the State Department, with European Party Foundation, so on, they always supported media and political groups and uh, human rights organization directly connected or included in that liberal environment, very isolated from the people mood. Mm. And that was also a very useful tool for Putin legitimization. First 15 years, they were not necessary to make repressions against liberal oppositions. First 20 years, let's say. It was even very good model just to show people who is the alternative to current political system. It's the same guys which rule you in 90s. It's the guys with the same ideas and same strategy. And that mobilized majority around Putin. You, you see? Yeah, no. yeah. I think, yeah, no, I think I see what you're saying. Cause I think obviously America's greatest issue with Russia isn't what it's doing internally. It's its biggest problem with Russia is its foreign policy. Uh, that's like the biggest source of tension. You mentioned Ukraine, there's the issue with Georgia and then of course Syria. And I mean, I will say living in the Middle East and having been to Syria, um, that was probably the biggest issue for the US because the US invested so much money in trying to collapse the Syrian state. And the 2015 Russian intervention, at least from the standpoint in the Middle East, prevented the collapse of Syria. I mean, it yeah, basically I know came the in point of like view. 
Well, no, no. What I wanted to ask you, though, is like, obviously, that's the way it's viewed in the Middle East is like Russia. And, and I mean, actually, objectively speaking, Russia prevented the collapse of the Syrian state to Al Qaeda and ISIS, which is which was better, a better outcome for Syrians. But I'm curious, you know, and also was a geopolitical game changer uh, for the Americans, um, which made them very angry. But I'm curious, how do Russians feel about about things like Syria and Ukraine? Do they care? Um, are they for it or against it? Um, what's the sentiment in Russia? Between all conflicts, Russia is included in. Mm -hmm. One have very special meaning for Russian Russian people. It's Ukraine. Of course, Ukraine is very. It's like Lebanon and Syria. Mm -hmm. It's the same language. It's a thousand years of the same statehood history. The same social experience, and finally. 15% of Russians have relatives in uh, Ukraine and 45% uh, of Ukrainians have relatives in Russia. So it's like this. And at least third part of Ukrainians, of Ukrainians after 30 years of hardcore propaganda associate themselves with Russia and Russian culture. And uh, between Russians, many have that let's say moderate or let's say nationalistic perspective that Ukraine is also part of Russia, at least Russian world. We can discuss if it is reality or nationalistic narrative, but still. So conflict in Ukraine was very sensitive for people. And conflict in Ukraine started from very clean interruption, imperialistic interruption in Ukrainian politics uh, from the West. Started from uh, <clears throat> events which looks like, smells like, and are governmental coup. Governmental coup made with assistance of far-right extremists with assistance of uh, oligarchy and uh, U.S. embassy. Yep. It doesn't mean that all response of Russian government was ideal, was good, was most uh, clever. Not at all. But that legitimize radical anti-Western rhetoric mm -hmm. and partly action, for example, support of pro-Russian militants uh, in Eastern Ukraine and in and accession of Crimea. And that event called in Russia, Russian Spring, because after many years, it was a huge mass movement in the Eastern and Southern Ukraine in Crimea, Donbass, and many other regions of Ukraine with strong pro-Russian sentiments. And accession of Crimea was extremely popular step. 86% of population supported and still supported. So when Putin administration took Crimea, it really first time, first and I hope the last time, create the real active support. It was indulgentian, you know, indulgentian. Like in Middle Asia, in Middle Ages, a Catholic Church sold uh, documents you can buy and then you see, you see, like, are forgiven. Ah, uh, yes, okay, right, right, right. So it was indulgence for all uh, former thieves of uh, government, ruling elite. It was patriotic act of justice and so on. It The, the feelings was like this. And then go, um, Western interpretation, mainstream interpretation of events were so 
long away from neutrality yeah from all journalistical journalistic standards as it never happened since yugoslavian tragedy or probably in syria it was the same but it was so obvious i lived in the west as a political refugee and all my friends were sitting in putin prisons for protest movement 2011 2012 mm-hmm. and as a swedish journalist i went to ukraine and it was terrible it was terrible fascists just forced people everywhere the level of uh, criminality under uh, uh, camouflated under nazi slogans was incredible it was crime 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 and crime and because as i said 15 percent of russians have relatives there yeah and i don't know 50 percent have friends and uh, uh, i don't know something whom they knew personally it was obvious yes. and people from eastern and southern ukraine was very pro-russian and they were forced they were destroyed some some of them were killed and the uh, ukrainian what called in west democratic revolution was open dictatorship mm-hmm. with level of political repressions governmental political repressions higher than in putin russia so and when west totally get in one side without any criticism and journalists start to boo, 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 repeat the same shit in a way we never see it's, even in, it's so in typical the, the uh, worst putin's propagandists it it's so like- typical it's so typical i mean this was the same thing with syria it's like in syria you yes. had you had fascists and you have fascists and nazi and neo-nazis in ukraine and still now the u.s is supporting these people um and in syria they were supporting jihadists who wanted to like kill minorities and again like the entire western media was just repeating what the state department is saying and it's infuriating when you're actually like have relatives there and friends there who are experiencing this and their experiences and the reality on the ground is just being totally I've erased in syria. yeah i've been in syria and uh, if we compare just two scenarios Bashar al-Assad and uh, all the guys who cut heads for for open hair uh, w- women with open hair yes Bashar Assad is better oh yeah it's like it's like lesser evil we always talk about lesser evil in the U.S and everybody understands lesser evil Trump versus Biden but like they can't but understand Bashar Assad is not <laughs> the angel as well it's very of course, bloody authoritarian of course, version. Of course a- absolutely but the and point is, is when yeah. then you ask about how people think about Syria people think about Syria it was never this popular as of course yeah because it looked like afghanistan in the 80s you know mm. it's some country far away from here oh, yeah. and russian boys should die there for what for some nice dictator who is friend with our president that's interesting okay, they're fighting on the right side probably but still but it's like there's no con- there's right. there's no con- there's no connection like with you say with Ukraine it's like there's a connection with Syria yes. it's far away yes. no that makes sense and that's that's what i i assumed uh, how i assumed it would be i want to i want to turn i just have a few more questions for you and i appreciate all of your time i want to turn to uh, another country that you have written about uh and also in jacobin oh no i'm sorry a new left review you wrote an excellent article um on the situation in belarus uh and you expressed skepticism of its opposition which has been also made into heroes by the west much like navalny um so i'm curious like you know how do you assess the lukashenko government and its opposition as well as the role of the west i mean you have critical words for all of them you know Belarus, Belarusia, Belarusia means white Russia, and it's even more similar on Russia. Everybody speaks just Russian. In Ukraine, there is Ukrainian language, and some people from Western Ukraine, 25 percent, really use it in everyday life. 
probably third party, I don't know. Uh, in uh, Belarus, everybody speaks just Russian. It's very, very Russian. It's very, very Soviet-style cities and so on. And uh, Belarus was a kind of uh, crystallized Russia all the time with some specification. Uh, Lukashenko, the Belarusian president, he created very special model with much less inequality, with much healthy economy, with much more industry and agriculture and every, more jobs. There is no rich people. They are very small middle class, but all working class feel themselves better than uh, working class in Russian province. Province. It's a very special model of the state uh, capitalism with some social state ruins. So first 15 years, Lukashenko was the uh, most popular politician in all post-Soviet uh, room, between all post-Soviet uh, peoples. And uh, <clears throat> Putin hated Lukashenko because he hated Lukashenko because he was only one politician who had higher ratings than uh, <laughs> Putin himself. Uh, Lukashenko in late nineties uh, uh, invited Russia to political integration to create a common country, and it was Russian oligarchs and Russian. Uh, uh, politicians, Russian president circle, who stopped that project, destroyed that project, because they look on Lukashenko as a former president, as a, as a uh, dangerous concurrent for political power. But then uh, Belarusian model became the one of many victims of the global economical crisis. And Lukashenko solved problems of crisis on the cost of the working class. Last 10 years, he made a lot of liberal reforms. He made higher uh, treatment age. He made, I, I described it, it's difficult to, um, I, I forgot all English words <laughs> to describe it. <laughs> but you can read it in uh, uh, new left review. Um, and uh, his popularity get much less and now it's less than 50%. It's difficult to, to know exactly because sociological researches are forbidden in uh, Belarus. Uh, but it's much, it was all, it was for many years, it was really 70 or 80%. Now it's less than 50 between 30 and 40, 45, probably. Uh, but Belarusian opposition was parody even on Russian opposition. Belarusian opposition ideologically, ideologically uh, create itself on the mix of hardcore liberalism, pro-West liberalism, and hardcore nationalism. Mm. And Belarusian nationalism is a very special thing that never been Belarusian state, never been in history before the Soviet Union collapse. And to create their historical uh, mythology, they apply to Middle Ages Lithuanian state, where Slavic population were probably majority, but it never called themselves Belarus. There was no even word White Russia or Belarus or something like this. So it's, it looks like very not natural ideology, which is acceptable for very few people from uh, nationalistic intelligence, less than one person probably, or two, I don't know, two person max. So the Russian opposition construct itself on a platform which is not acceptable for 95% of people. 
but very acceptable and understandable for West, Western politicians, Western uh, foundations, uh, sponsors, and all that progress, uh, you know, when activists came and study freedom of speech. <gasps> How are you living here in Germany? So nice, so nice houses, you know. Mm, nice. <laughs> What is about freedom of speech? It's just free. Freedom. Wow. So all that... <laughs> Uh, exchange programs worked for that very small, very isolated, very sectant, sectantic sect. Sectary? Sectary, sectary environment. And that environment was when uh, regime just used that environment to show all the way, look, those strange vegetables, they can speak even And they speak about strange things. And probably LGBT and, uh, you know, feminism means the same that uh, those Middle Ages fantasies about Lithuanian state, state. And for many years, that system was in balance. Marginal opposition, which made all to be marginal, unpopular, crazy. Like in Russia, liberal opposition is at least five or seven percent mm. in homest election in belarus is two one two. <laughs> wow um then two years uh two years ago <coughs> happened strange things came new leaders mm-hmm. where they came from they came from nearest lukashenko circle The former Lukashenko's um, guy who was chief of the bank for all oil trade through Belarus. So he was connected, the main candidate to, to, from opposition, Babarika. He was connected with the Gazprom, the main Russian gas oligarch, the one of strongest group in Russian state oligarchy. And as a banker, just financial um, guy, Wall Street from mm. Minsk, he was uh, very, very liberal minded, understandable for West, but still he was totally new guy. And he was demonstrative, not interested in all that strange nationalistic narrative about Belarusian language, which is unfortunately forget it. Nobody use it. Ten person ca- probably in villages in West Belarus, but even them speak Russian, if to speak honest. But okay, he, he was not interested in all that boring discussion about languages, about Middle Ages history, mm-hmm. about all that hardcore liberalism <clears throat> in a sectary way. He was okay. Let's let's make just normal. Not corrupted uh, statehood, not corrupted uh, governmental apparat. Between us, the <clears throat> Belarusian state is less corrupted than all post-Soviet mm-hmm. states. Less corrupt. Much more disciplinated. But anti-corruption, all that, you know, narrative of the everyday rational mind. Mm-hmm. Can we stop with stupid things? Can we take away all that unpopular laws of last years? So that um, unsatisfaction of last 10 years of economical economical troubles and uh, uh, growing inequality summarized to that neutral guy who looked very serious. He came from the top. He is Lukashenko's top bureaucrat and businessman. He looked serious. He looked not sectarious. So he looked as an acceptable um, choice in bourgeois elections mm-hmm. where workers should vote, vote for some powerful guys from the top of society. And he had quite strong, let's say, apparatus. He had support and money as everybody knew, but 
difficult to prove from Russian, Russian uh, oligarchy. And he's transparent and understandable for West at the same time. Yeah. yeah. He's a bridge. So, uh, and who was around him? It was a people from that old sectary opposition with idiotic language and uh, Middle Ages dogs, dogs in uh, head. Mm-hmm. But they were in shadow. Still, they were in shadow. It looks very acceptable. So millions of people, hypothetically, sought to vote for him. And Lukashenko made the most stupid thing. He imprisoned uh, Baba. <laughs> made him into a martyr. And two guys after him. He imprisoned two candidates in presidential elections. And the only one who left uh, in campaign was the wife of one of them, of, of the three. And all protests collected and summarized to that woman. Opposition mm-hmm. said that it was 80%, uh, he got, she got 80%. I don't really believe in it, sorry. And German research, which I uh, linked on, showed that level of support is comparable. So hypothetically, in August, I, I would say, I would guess that in August 2020, Lukashenko got 50 something percent of votes and probably lose Minsk. Mm. But his apparat painted 80 right. and it was yeah. unbelievable. Right. Unbelievable. And that provoked the huge, you know, explosion of protest. And then right. Lukashenko made a new, more stupid thing, which he can could do. He answered with a huge level of repressions. It's yeah. very peaceful society. Russia is quite aggressive environment. <laughs> you know, many nations, uh, imperial history, and many discussions. Belarus is peaceful, quiet, mm-hmm. A bit boring province. All factories are working. Eight hours working day. You get up early, working hard, looking TV. And then in that country, police beat people on streets everywhere. You know, there is an anecdote when police attack the guy and he, he is shooting, shutting Oh no, stop guys, I I, I I vote for Lukashenko and they beat him. Shut up, nobody vote for Lukashenko. So that police violence provoked the highest huge explosion. And the biggest demonstration was reaction on the police violence. And all working uh, strikes was strikes against even not about elections, it was against political violence. And then opposition did all to isolate the democratic movement. <laughs> they, start to speak. they published program with privatization of everything, include, I don't know, air. And Belarusians saw how total privatization uh, influence on Russia and Ukraine. There are a lot of examples. Nobody wants to repeat Russian 90s. And they had also three years of some the same shit in the early 90s. Yeah. So it's an unpopular program. They publish it. And then uh, uh, Lukashenko's propaganda just look. It's <laughs> That's all he, he doesn't have to do. Yeah. He doesn't have to do anything else. Just say look. And that, so yeah. They did everything to isolate themselves. Yeah. Because part of them are really dogmatics, be, really hard believers in all that brutal, nationalistic and liberal shit. Yeah. And uh, those media, those Telegram channels, for example, huge, they work the same in the same manipulative way as a governmental propaganda. Mm-hmm. So there was not moral differences between yeah. two sides, two bad yeah. sides. 
and those liberal engagement prevent the working class to join the movement prevent that you know part of society in the between to join to the protest movement that's what I, what I i meant i really do and i really your your piece in the new left review is so excellent and i encourage people to check it out um and i can link to it in the description i just i wanted to touch on another issue very quickly and that is the issue of covid just because you know um I guess I'm curious how you don't have to like go too in depth here, but how did the Russian government handle its COVID response in your view? You know, at first it seemed to be in denial. Then uh, there was a rapid development of this very effective vaccine and, um, and this kind of generous vaccine diplomacy. Um, and then now it seems like Russia is sort of suffering from something similar to the U S which is this anti-vaccine kind of sentiment or movement. So I'm curious, like, is how was the COVID response in Russia? And do you have an anti-vaccine movement that is becoming yes, an have. obstacle to, <laughs> oh, not, not there too. Goodness, you can't get away from it, <laughs> but, but go ahead. It's a complicated question. So very complicated. In some way, in my opinion, that anti-vaccine movement together with very uh, dirty medieval prejudice, they also have huge democratic potential. Mm. Let me believe in it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I will try to explain what I mean. Okay. Russian, first, Russian government, Russian elite and Putin personally is an opportunist. So they play all roles available in menu and sometimes the same time. Same time, they are saying, we do not have um, uh, COVID, then we have COVID, then uh, terrible, terrible, we should make the fantastic dicta medicine dictatorship with all that QR codes and uh, electronic um, uh, uh, you know, documents and passports and all that and restrictions and straps and so on. And they say it almost together. It's the same people saying different things one after another. So that create a chaotic atmosphere. Um, last autumn, last summer even and autumn, um, all channels of TV start to make advertisement of Russian vaccine. We are the first country who made vaccine, mm -hmm. but nobody know how to find it, but we are the first one. Then <laughs> uh, authorities were scared. Problem was that during 30 years of Russian democracy, they destroyed all pharmaceutical uh, industry mm -hmm. and they not made the production of vaccine fast. So during one year, there were not enough vaccine and they start and they, I mean, propaganda and media apparatus and elite uh, made a, had a narrative that vaccine could be dangerous. You know, look on AstraZeneca, British one. Uh, they have many problems with AstraZeneca. There, they destroy uh, um, civil civil freedoms. Uh, they made a sanitary dictatorship. They create atmosphere where a lot of people were scared of vaccination. But in late May or June, factories finally started. Was started. They mm -hmm. may produce enough vaccines. And government change those narrative just like this. Everybody should go, should go now to directly now to hospitals and make vaccine. My father, he is 80 years old and his wife became victims of that type of opportunism, of that type of, you know, changing position. Mm -hmm. they, were, they looked TV, believed in it. And they were waiting until July. In the beginning of July, all propaganda said, get up, 
go to hospital made vaccine and all 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 bosses in all enterprises pressed on uh, workers in budget enterprises in uh, big industry in hospitals everywhere in schools that they have to make mm-hmm. vaccine during nearest days other way they would lose jobs so like vaccine mandate basically it was in 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 words it was uh, we are free country but in practice it's enormous pressure which provoked you know reaction yeah what why you have should... to get a vaccine yeah <laughs> why in, in such level of pressure i'm working hard or you know i'm a pregnant wo- woman thousands of pregnant women do had a medicine reasons to not make vaccine but those bosses in job no i don't care about i got from president administration order go now and make vaccine and i don't care about explanation and they close all you know uh, uh, cabinets in hospitals which could make your document that you have medical uh, reasons to know okay so don't care if you have um, been infected two weeks ago or Mm. you're pregnant or you have some um, so you're saying the you're, so you're saying the so government let me, let me just uh, finish uh. my father and his wife went to hospital they were house there thousands of people there i made vaccine once one month before that hysteric and there was empty because <laughs> propaganda said sit home wait wait and he came it was thousands of people they stay in line two and a half hours get vaccine and were infected and my father's wife died a month ago from COVID. And my oh, father was in hospital for a month. And wh- who is uh, responsible for this? Who is it? They, they provoke that house. That all hospitals were full of people. And that pressure. So they, they, oh, got, they got COVID. They got COVID at the hospital? You're saying they got COVID at they the got, hospital? Like, they, they, they felt themselves, they, themselves ill fifth day after vaccine i see I because see. there was they they were sitting between thousands of people yeah. in line yeah. yeah after years they were sitting home in isolation they came at, and it's a very typical situation yeah so of course then it it's like it it was terrible done yeah Everything. it was done it terribly was, by all that all that jumps in propaganda was very cynic you know they just count now we don't have enough vaccines and d- didn't say any any word about that they manipulate with people like this and they not speak with people they not say arguments they just press Stand up and go. Otherwise, you will lose your job. Yeah, it's a terrible way to do public health policy. And of course, I see what you're saying. It's like the anti-vaccine movement becomes a reaction to it became uh, an ineffective public health context. rollout. During 30 years, Soviet Union was championed in the wall by the discipline of vaccinations. There was mm-hmm. no vaccine uh, dissidents. Why? Because medicine was very available, very qualificated every it was very people's medicine so 99 percent have reasons to believe to that system then yeah. 30 years medicine from the common service transformed to the to the commercial service to the uh you know the private market it's the private, private it's like market. the private market if yeah you have money it would be good if you do mm-hmm. not have money it would be terrible of so course. because majority is poor for them it's terrible so right. 30 years teach them to not believe in all that part of governmental systems that bad medicine for poor people they do not believe right and people are buying documents electronic all that core codes 
because uh, for two months it was forbidden to visit a restaurant in Moscow mm-hmm. without that electronic shit. Yeah. And they're excellent to get straffs, to get money from people if they do not have mask on face or visit a restaurant or do something wrong. No, I think what you're saying is actually if it's very it applies to a lot of the West where it's a lot of the vaccine hesitancy and that entire like a skepticism of authority has a lot to do with the neoliberal decay of healthcare and other aspects of government institutions. So people just can't like people have a difficult time trusting. There's like a lack of trust. That's the way to put it. A lack of trust. And that's interesting. The sort of the juxtaposition of Soviet Union being this leader in vaccine uh, and, and giving vaccines versus this difficulty now and what you're describing. There's just one last thing I wanted to ask you about, which kind of goes back to the Alexei Navalny issue, but I forgot to ask it earlier. And that is, you mentioned in the elections that the the only opposition really was the communists. Um, but I did see someone, I, I saw someone saying that, that Navalny's movement was taking credit for the votes that the communists got. Is that right? And was it, I mean, is there is there a, po- a certain kind of like, what are the left politics, I guess? What are the left politics in Russia? You're, an act, you're a leftist activist. Is there any left leftist politics in Russia? <laughs> All your questions are so complicated that it's difficult <laughs> to answer short and briefly and um, full. So I would say Russia is still one of the most left countries in Europe, at least. Probably Greece right. is the first and Russia is the second. I would say, I I would guess. But that understanding of what is left could be different. In Russian sense, uh, I had even a lecture in New York University, it's available in some way in YouTube, um, about Russian red and brown. So uh, some form of uh, uh, worldview and uh, system of values which mixed socialistic uh, values and aims with patriotic one. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it um, creates uh, phenomena very unusual in West, mm-hmm. where left, political left, those who demand nationalization, I don't know, common uh, transport and so on, uh, social guarantees. The same time, very cons- conservative in uh, cultural sense, anti-LGBT, and so on. Very patriotic. You can compare it with Latin America leftism, where left also almost always means patriots, anti-American, anti-imperialist left. Or you can compare it with uh, post-Maoist environment in uh, Western Europe. You know, mm-hmm. very special. But in Russia, it's a mainstream of left politics. There is second very important thing which one should know about left politics and not left poli- Let's say about Communist Party, the biggest political structure on the left side of Russian politics and probably biggest political structure in country. Mm -hmm. Uh, Communist Party was restored on the ruins of the Soviet Union. There were few of initiatives and all of them, except one, participated in revolutionary movement. 1992 and 1993 against liberal reforms and criminal privatization. And they supported parliament, the Supreme Soviet. And they were exactly them who were shattered by Yeltsin tanks in October 1993. And the only one left oppositional organization whose leader, Gennady Zyuganov, called in, Chen, in the most dramatic day called his supporter to not come to the, to not defend White House, the parliamentary building, 
was Gennady Zyuganov, the leader of current political, of current Communist Party of Russian Federation. After parliament was destroyed, all leaders of left and patriotic opposition were in prison. Those organizations were formally forbidden, forbidden. Mm -hmm. and Zyuganov were recognized by Yeltsin government, Yeltsin regime, as a legal communist. So current communist party was from the very beginning was a form of to canalize the protest mood and protest uh, feelings in the very controlled way. Then the organizing structure of the Communist Party was built on a very interesting and specific fundament. It was social fundament. It was a people who, who called in the 90s the Red Directors, the former Soviet nomenclature, leader of the regional <coughs> departments of the Communist Party, or uh, directors of the huge Soviet industry enterprises, who were not satisfied with new liberal politics of uh, Yeltsin and uh, Igor Gaidar government, but who was still elite, mm -hmm. who still recognized in a personal life that if they would privatize a uh, factory with hundred thousands of workers, even if they would sell iron from the machines, they became they would become dollar billionaires, and many of them did it. But mm -hmm. as a social environment, that red directors demand, let's say, uh, Keynesianism, Keynesian, Keynesianistic capitalism with strong social state and private property, with uh, social guarantees in order to create the market, uh, big internal market, demand, market demand. So that specific part of Russian elite, not the top elite, but the massive of elite, they evolutionated for 30 years. They are not red directors anymore, but um, owners of uh, enterprises which produce uh, uh, stuff for internal market are really interested in kind of social democratic compromise. They still want to be businessmen or big bosses, but they see that poverty of majority li is limitation for those production. Yeah. So it's exactly them who, who was who who are body, political and social body, sponsors and the force of Communist Party. Mm -hmm. In the 90s, those from the instead of real radical communists and socialists and many other groups with nationalists, together with nationalists, fighting on streets, they were fighting in very legal way because they were interested not to get the throne. They were interested in compromise. Yeah. And they got compromise. First, they got 1995, they got the biggest parliamentary fraction in Duma. And Yeltsin recognized it. Then they got more than half of Russian regions were led by red governors, the red belt. Uh, then 1998, they got after a huge crisis, financial crisis, they got even government from Communist Party. One year, just one year was enough. And it was most successful government ever in all 30 years of New Russia. It was the growing of economy. We should say thank you to them, not to Vladimir Putin, who came after them. In 2000s, Putin formulated new compromise. And half of that former red directors just entered to the new governmental party. They were not ideologically motivated communists, as me. Mm -hmm. But um, 
so but part of them are still supporting communist party and voting for communist party of course it's not only red uh, red bourgeoisie of mm. course working class voting for them because it that program is not communist program but kind of social democratic program partly in those interests yeah to grow up interest. but the main problem of communist party is that they never wanted to take power they wanted just to blackmail an oligarchy to make compromises all the time 1996 the communist leader united one of one elections finally and recognize Boris Yeltsin victory. Uh. <laughs> After that, each time Communist Party get more than official official results, which we can read and which were which are published, mm-hmm. that made them not real force. So, if you are very oppositional as me, you always think should I vote for that threaters, for that compromise rats, you know, for that opportunists. And many years when administration was very strong, Communist Party leadership did all to destroy the uh, most strong and ideologically motivated groups inside party. Mm-hmm. Because your positional activity said them to those young organizations many times, or to those Moscow, former Moscow organization, your protest activity make problems in our conversation with uh, president administration. And how many votes you will bring with you? How many votes? And who count votes? It's them who count votes. We will make conversation. And now, according to laws of dialectic, they destroyed all those, you know, um, manipulators, all those all groups and uh, um, organizations who can make street agitation, make good uh, website. They are just bureaucrats in those uh, local. Yeah. And but now. Uh, present now new level of dictatorship made situation that nobody start conversation they just yeah. understand you will get as usually a certain person but we can make, make many more doesn't matter doesn't but you know protest mood people people would vote for us and they and like that situation for them to be a bit more radical mm-hmm. and also there is other process that during many years they came new generation which are more free from from you know all soviet nostalgia from all that nationalistic star and conservative stereotypes who involved in protest movement in in some regions in some districts Candidates of Communist Party are really so active, uh, Bernie Sanders style local politicians, mm. and that so they have a new. That's left actually that's active. actually what I was gonna say. I was gonna say what you're talking about sounds so much to me like what we call the squad, like uh, Bernie right. Sanders, like uh, the progressive Democrats, like um, AOC. Like Ilhan this. Omar, yeah, yeah. This this is okay. what, what you're party saying. Is little better than Democratic Party in US. Mm. Little yeah. bit better. <laughs> Fair, <laughs> After yes. Long criticism, much mm. better. Mm. Uh, problem that they do not want to take power, but some yeah. local leaders and many activists really want. Yeah. And some of them even come, oh, let's say, socialists. And there are left wing alias like left front. Mm-hmm. So, p- real picture as always more complicated as all that primitive criticism. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> and finally, as I began, the just current situation is the only whom you can vote if you do not like what is going on in the country is Communist Party. So, wind, s- strong wind coming in those seal 
And some of them have had ambition to take that wind. Okay, we usually got 30 percent. Now we would got 20. In reality, we would got 50. But uh, government have to accept 30 percent as a result. Mm -hmm. We would get much more places in parliament. So there is, let's say, the radical wing is partly ideological motivated people, partly uh, just active people in the grassroots level, and partly a career motivated people who decided that protest wave is enough strong to surf in on it. Right. That coalition on the left side forcing a bit party to be more radical than party yeah. collect now not less than governmental party in reality yeah but result was falsificated and what to do where is your practical force what is your practical force material force how you would fight for your results before they controlled the street last 10 years they spent to destroy all those active uh, regional structures mm -hmm. and to fight with uh, street activities because it's pro-West liberals uh, threat. Yeah. Instead to create its own street mobilization. Yes, yeah. They fight against liberals, against Navalny. And now they got 35% of votes, but they do not have any material force to defend those results. Even if they well, won't. It sounds like the state of the Russian left is maybe uh, in a better position than, like you said, in the U.S., but of course still has a lot of work to do. Um, on that note, thank you so much for joining me to explain all this and break all these very important and different but related topics down. Uh, Alexi, where can people follow your work? Mostly in Russian. Then they can <laughs> read every day. But in English, Yakabin sometimes, it's very long way when you send an article, then right. two weeks, no answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yakabin and uh, New Left Review, there was criticism against my last article and I didn't answer because my father's wife died and I was totally... Which I, 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 I apologize for your... That's like our my condolences for, for your loss and your father's loss. But thank you so much for joining us. Alexei mm -hmm. Saknin, Russian leftist, activist, journalist. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much.